Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. Okay. Uh, is my voice coming through clear, Pastor? Yes, it's good. Okay, very good, very good. Well, uh, it certainly is different, the format that we have taken, but thank the Lord that uh, we can still be together. And I've been enjoying the various testimonies and songs, and uh, for sure we are free. Uh, not free because we uh, live in a land where we are not harassed, uh, where we are not oppressed, but free because of what Jesus has done for us. You know, it is said that the greatest enslavement is the enslavement of the mind. And we know that the enslavement that we've been entangled in, humanity that is, is the bondage of sin. And so one could be behind prison bars, but still be free in Jesus, because he serves a risen Savior. And as the song was sung, who is in the world today, we know that he is living, whatever men may say. I thank the Lord for the opportunity that we have, and I thank God for our pastor and the leadership and and just everything that is being done to keep our spirits up and to continue as a family of God to strengthen each other and to continue in our walk with Him. Uh, thank my brother Jeff. It was good to hear your voice and his musical rendition, and just thankful for all the testimonies. Uh, it has truly joyed my heart and warmed my soul. Um, I really wish we were together physically, seeing each other. I miss seeing the faces and being able to share the word and interact that way, but I'm still thankful to God for the privilege uh, that we have today. I've uh, been enjoying Pastor's series uh, but uh, he saw it fit to have me come in somewhere there. And so by God's grace, I hope today as we look at his word, uh, it will encourage us, even with the things that we've been presented with the last several weeks uh, from the various presentations and the Bible studies. Well, this morning, I want us to turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59, and the title will be taken from a verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 59, verse 19 and 20. I hope this morning as we look at God's word, uh, we will uh, be encouraged, that we will be reminded that we serve a God who is able. And so as you have turned to this passage of scripture, I want us to start with a word of prayer so that the Spirit of God will speak to each of our hearts. See, everyone is in different places today, in different circumstances, and only the Lord knows what each need to hear. So Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19 and 20 will be our springboard text. But let us have a word of prayer before we actually dive into the word of God. Father and our God, we are thankful to you for your grace and your mercy upon us. Lord, this moment as we are gathered in different places, different homes, different circumstances, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit may visit each and every heart that's on the line today, whether there are those on the line are Christians or not. Father, I pray that as I speak from your word, that your spirit will speak to each and every heart. For Lord, who knows the heart of a man or the mind of a person except the spirit that is within him or her? But the Lord knows each and every one of us. And so, Father, today we pray that you may speak 
and that I and everyone else will listen. May we hear your voice. May we sense your presence. May the word presented today, Lord, will encourage hearts to continue to go forward in Jesus. May your name be uplifted, Father. We pray that truly only you will be glorified, that I may be hid behind the cross of Christ Jesus, and may he be lifted up. And as Jesus and his word is lifted up, that all will be drawn to you, and all glory and honor will go to your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19 and 20. As I said, this will be our springboard text. And the title this morning is, When the Enemy Comes in Like a Flood. Or we could see it in another way. The Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against the enemy. You see, friends, we are living in a day and time where we know that final movements are ahead. We're living in a day and time where we know that the enemy is going about still as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But we have encouragement from the Word of God. Right here in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 19 and 20. And I hope you're there, friends. And I want you to listen or read along with me. Verse 19 says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now as we look at this verse of scripture, right away we get the understanding that this is speaking about God's divine intervention, God's divine protection, God's divine preservation, and even his divine provision. But let's look at this verse of scripture a little more closely, and I want you to observe several things here with me. That first of all, that there is a condition to be met for God to lift up a standard when the enemy comes in like a flood. What's that condition, friends? That condition is found in the first part of verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. For God to lift up a standard against the enemy when the enemy comes in like a flood, and to bring his divine intervention, his deliverance, we must be fearing the name of the Lord. That word fear means to honor, respect, reverence, Revere the name of the Lord. And friends, we will notice here that fear in the name of the Lord is not just one time or two time. The text says those who fear the name of the Lord, basically from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Those who are fearing the name of the Lord all the time. But I like what verse 20 says. Verse 20 goes on to tell us that when we meet this condition and when the Lord lifts up a standard against the enemy, that the Redeemer shall come and he will come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgressions, which are those who fear the name of the Lord all the day long. So number one, friends, there's a condition here that we see in this verse of Scripture for God's divine intervention to come into our experience, for God to divinely protect us, preserve us, and even provide for us that we must be fearing his name all the day long and be turning from transgression. The second thing here, friends, I want us to observe from this scripture is that the enemy here is represented as a flood. 
Right there in verse 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. We'll look at a passage of scripture in just a moment where it talks about the enemy coming in like a flood and how God lifts up a standard against the enemy. The third thing that I want you to look at here and observe with me is that it is the Lord who will lift up a standard. There the Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the word or the Lord there is Jehovah. Jehovah is the self-existent, self-existent, eternal, supreme being. So when the enemy comes in like a flood into our lives, it is the one who is the self-existent, eternal, supreme being that will come in and stand between us and the enemy, between us and the enemy coming in like a flood. Now who can stand up against the Lord Jehovah? Who can win against the one who is supreme, eternal, all sufficient. But friends, you're going to see a little bit more here as we look at the fourth thing, and that is the word standard. The fourth thing to observe here is the word standard. Now, in the 1828 Webster, uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it tells us that the word standard uh, basically means three things. One is that it means a banner. Two is that it means a criterion or a standard, something that has that we would measure one thing against or weigh something against, a criterion. Then the third thing which I personally like is that a standard represents a battle flag. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises a battle flag. And when God raises a battle flag against the enemy, the enemy will be turned to fight. The enemy has to flee. That's why verse 20 says that the Redeemer or the Deliverer will come to Zion and come unto those who turn from transgression those who once again are those who fear, revere, honor, and respect the name of the Lord. So friends, four things. One, again, there is a condition here for God's intervention to be seen in our lives. Number two, here the enemy represents a flood. Number three, the standard represents here God's battle flag. But it also represents the criterion, and it also represents a standard. Let me talk about that for just a second, friends, because the one thing that I did not mention that we can see from this verse of Scripture is that in order for God to raise a standard or a battle flag, we too have to be raising a standard. That is, we too have to be meeting the criterion. What's the criterion? The criterion here, according to these two verses of Scripture, is to have the fear of the Lord, or to respect, revere, or honor the Lord, to turn from transgression. So we see, friends, that in order for God to offer us divine intervention, we will have to fear, we'll have to reverence, We have to trust the name of the Lord for God to intervene in our circumstances. Now, friends, there is a classic story in the Bible, if you will, that vividly comes to mind, and that is the story of the Exodus. God delivered his people from Exodus, from Egypt, rather, which represents bondage to sin. As it were, he was calling them out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so as they were on their journey towards the promised land, 
the enemy came up against them, and their enemy that came up against them was Pharaoh and his host, Pharaoh and his army. Now, what did God do when the enemy rushed in like a flood? When Egypt came up, the armies of Egypt came up against the people of God. What was the standard that God raised up against the enemy? Well, you know the story well. The first thing that God did was that he caused fire to come between his people and the armies of Egypt. You see, friends, when God raises a standard, supernatural things take place. God uses the natural things to bring about supernatural acts. We also see the next natural thing that God used as a standard to come between his people and Egypt is the Red Sea. As the armies of Egypt were pursuing the people of God, God spoke to Moses to lift up his rod. The Red Sea parted. God's people went through on dry ground. And when they reached the other side, God caused the water to overflow the enemy. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, my friends, God raises up a standard against the enemy once we have met friends the condition then the promise will be verified upon us but is this just applicable to those who were exodus from egypt is this just applicable to those who were in the time of isaiah or is this also applicable to we who are living in these last days? And how will God raise up a standard against the enemy when he comes in like a flood against us who are living in these last days? Does the Bible speak to this? Well, there's a chapter in the Bible, friends. This is not new to a lot of us, and that is, the book of Revelation, chapter 12. You see, my friends, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, the scripture tells us, but we are fighting against principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places. And so the battles that we find ourselves engaged in, there is a bigger battle that is being waged. Even the battles that are being waged by governments and by nations, there is a bigger battle, a bigger war, I should say, behind those wars. Revelation chapter 12 brings to mind this war. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 onwards tells us that there was war in heaven, that Michael and his angels, fought against the dragon, and the dragon also fought with his angel. Now we know that the dragon, verse 9 tells us, is that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the world. So the devil, Satan, was fighting a war against Michael, who we understand from studying the Bible is Jesus Christ and his angel. Now, did the devil win that war in heaven? Oh, no. The devil, the Bible tells us, that he did not win that battle in heaven, but that he was cast out of heaven. So he lost the war there, and he is now here on earth, stirring up strife, misery, and contention. But because he lost there, and he knows he cannot win against God. He brought that war to the people of God. Now, we see that symbolized here in Revelation chapter 12. And just for the sake of 
all those who are on the line, some people are familiar with Revelation chapter 12. Others may not be so familiar uh, with this chapter. I'll just do a quick review of what is taking place here. Because the, the part of Revelation chapter 12 that I really want to uh, focus in on is, are the latter verses, 13 onwards, where we see the enemy rushing in like a flood and God raises up a standard against the enemy. But there is a repetition that takes place here in this chapter. So how did the devil, the dragon, that serpent, bring the war that he started in heaven, the war which he lost to the people of God, and how did God raise up a standard against the enemy when he came in upon God's people like a flood? Revelation 12 vividly brings this to mind. Yes, it's symbolic, but let's look at it. First, in the beginning of the chapter, it tells us that there was a woman, uh, and it brought, brings to mind that this woman was adorned with various things. She was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, 12 stars around her head. Now, we understand these symbolisms from studying the Bible, that it represents various things. Uh, she was clothed, uh, friends, with the righteousness of Jesus. Not just uh, the righteousness of Jesus as a covering, but the righteousness of Jesus by faith was her message. Uh, she was standing upon the moon. That was her foundation. And when we study the Bible, we'll find that there is a particular foundation that God's people in the Old Testament stood upon, and that is the sanctuary messages that were symbolized there in types, or that was presented in types and in symbols. But that also points to Jesus Christ, who is the rock, the foundation upon which the people of God Stand. And the, the stars there, we know the 12 stars, represent the leadership of God's church. In the Old Testament, there were 12, um, 12 tribes. And in the New Testament, God had 12 disciples, 12 apostles. And you can go back and study these things in the scripture, my friends, but we don't have the time to look at the scriptures with them. I just want to re just refresh our minds for a minute so we can get to where. Uh, by God's grace, I want us to get to an, by God's grace, God can encourage us that in various uh, aspects of the journeying of God's people, that he raised up a standard when the enemy rushed in like a flood. So after it tells us about this woman and that she is impregnated and ready to give birth to a man-child, which chapter 12 here very clearly tells us that he was caught up to God and his throne, verse 5, and he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, with who is none other than Jesus Christ himself. By the way, the woman here represents God's church. We see that very clearly in the Bible, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 2. It tells us there that the daughter of Zion is likened unto a delicate and a comely woman. Uh, Jesus refers to the church as his bride. And so we see here, brought to view again, the church of God, who is about to give birth to a child who is none other than Jesus Christ himself. But as the church was to give birth to Jesus, and understand, friends, that uh, Jesus, yes, was born of Mary, born of a woman, because the Bible is very clear that in due time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. But what the Bible does is that the Bible intertwines the experience of the church 
with the experience of Mary. And so Mary is about to give birth to Jesus, but as she is about to give birth to Jesus, this is Jesus being born to the church. And so the woman here primarily represents the church of God. Secondarily, it is Mary. So Jesus is about to be born to the church, but the enemy does not want Jesus to be born. He does not want Jesus to survive. Because, friends, when you study the prophecies of the Bible, it is very clear the purposes of the life of Jesus, what he was to be born for, what he was going to do, and the enemy was very well aware of that. And so when Jesus was about to be born, the enemy came in to destroy our Lord and Savior. Notice with me verse 4. It tells us um, here that, And the tail of the dragon drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and he cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now we know that the devil does not just come up and pounces upon up on us, but that the devil works through various entities, and that the entity or the institution that the devil works through then to destroy or to devour the man child who is Christ Jesus, that that was pagan Rome. But the devil cannot stop the plans of God. You know, friends, do you know that God has a plan for our lives? Jeremiah chapter 29 is very clear on that. God says, I know the plans that I have towards you, says the Lord. Plan of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And that expected end is to redeem us, to deliver us, and that involves the man-child. And so the enemy cannot stop the plan of God. He cannot stop the plans that God has in store for us. Plans of good and not of evil. And so you know the story. Uh, Jesus, his life when he was a child, uh, he was not destroyed by Herod. But rather, he was, uh, he was spared, he was delivered when the enemy came in like a flood in the form of that pagan government to try and stop the plans of God to come in to destroy the Son of God. But notice verse 6, my friends, because verse 6 brings to view this woman who is God's church once again, the woman represents God's people. And I want you to see here, friends, again, how God came in and intervened when the enemy came in like a flood to destroy God's people. Verse 6 says, and the woman fled into the wilderness. Again, this is not uh, speaking of Mary, as you will see, friends, Mary was not in the wilderness for the time period that's mentioned here in the scripture. Verse 6 again, and the woman, God's church, God's people, fled into a place prepared of God. Notice, friends, God prepared this place for her, that she should, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, that's 1,260 days. So there was a time period allotted where God intervened and God took care of the woman, the church, when the dragon through pagan Rome came up against her. When he came in like a flood, God lifted up a standard against the enemy and delivered his church. But notice that God's deliverance, my friends, uh, you know, people oftentimes want God to deliver them 
where they are in their circumstances, um, in the way that they want God to deliver them, the way that they seem see that is best suitable for them. But I want you to notice here, friends, that God's deliverance involved the woman moving or fleeing, being transported, if you will, from where she presently was to a different location all together. Remember, friends, for God to intervene in our circumstances, we have to trust him. We have to follow him. We have to take him at his word. And so God's divine intervention came in the form of his people being removed from the presence of the dragon and being moved into a different locale, as it were. But I want you to also notice here, friends, that God had a time period allotted for her to be nourished or for her to be fed. You know, in our various circumstances, sometimes it seems like it's going to be forever. It seems like it's never going to end. It seems like it's going to be everlasting and we are tempted to grow weary and we're tempted to give up. But here we see in verse 6, my friends, that it is only for a time period that God or the enemy will be allowed, friends, to come after us, that it will not be forever. In fact, this is not the only verse of Scripture that talks about God divinely delivering His people. Verse 14, if you look there with me, is very clear regarding this as well, as verse 14 is really a repetition of what we just read in verse 6. Verse 14 says, uh, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might flee into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent, which is the very same time period that we see there in verse 6, 1,260 days. Again, friends, trials and tribulations will not last forever. There is a time period that is allotted for us to go through trials and tribulation, and then, my friends, God will bring his final deliverance. But before the final deliverance comes, there is a type of deliverance that God wants his people to experience, but that involves, here we can see, God's people being removed into a different location, and the Bible quotes it here as the wilderness. Now, friends, let me ask you this question. Was there a time when God brought his people into the wilderness, apart from this time being brought to view in Revelation chapter 12, which, by the way, is the time period, many of us know, of 538 to 17? 98. Can you think of another period of time when God brought his people into the wilderness? And as you're thinking about that, my friends, I want to uh, let you know that God has a purpose for bringing us into the wilderness. He has a purpose for wanting us to go to the wilderness during the time of persecution when the enemy comes in like a flood upon us. And here the verses brings it to view. Verse 6, first of all, tells us that God prepared that place for her. God had a place prepared for his people, and that place was in the wilderness then. Verse 14 gives us more information as to what he wants to do for them while he brings them into the wilderness. And you will notice there it tells us that he brings them into the wilderness to nourish them, to preserve them, if you will, my friends, to protect them, to provide for them. That's why he brings them 
into the wilderness. But that is only for a time period because then he wants them to do a mighty work for him after they come out of that wilderness experience. You know, sometimes again in our experiences, friends, it seems like uh, we're alone. Sometimes it may seem as if God is not doing anything in our lives. But it is in those uh, quiet moments, those moments of solitude that God wants us to turn our hearts to him, to spend those intimate moments with him. Right now, during this pandemic, many people are feeling like that. Many people are feeling as if they are perhaps abandoned. Some people are feeling destitute. Some people can't wait for the day when all of this will be uh, over with. But, oh, friends, this is an occasion for us to draw close to God. This is an occasion for us to be nourished by God because, friends, we know the final movements will be rapid ones. We know the next great event, my friends, will require of us to put forth almost superhuman efforts. And now we are given an opportunity to see where our hearts are with the Lord so that we may know our own spiritual condition and, friends, draw close to God. So here, friends, we see the enemy rushes in like a flood and God raises up a standard and the standard that God raised up here, my friends, for his people to deliver them was the wilderness. Oh, friends, that's where God wants us to be. Not in the great cities of the world. Not in the, the densely populated areas, friends. Just as God during those years of 538 to 1798 brought his church into the wilderness to nourish her, so it is that God today is calling us to go forth into the wilderness, the place where he has prepared for us. That is his standard that he will raise up for us in these last days, my friends, when the enemy comes in like a flood. But, oh, friends, when you look at verse 15, before we go to a passage of Scripture that talks about the wilderness, look with me at verse 15. Even there we can see it. Verse 15 says, And the serpent, who is the dragon, who is the devil, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, what did God do once again? What was the standard that God raised up? How did God deliver his people when the serpent sent water like a flood against his church, against his people? Again, Isaiah 59 tells us, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against the enemy. What was the standard that God used here, my friends, to deliver his people? The verse of Scripture here tells us um, there in verse 16, it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now again, friends, this is all symbolic. We know the water here, according to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, water represents multitudes and peoples and languages and nations. So when the serpent sends out, my friends, nations or multitudes, uh, people, groups, after his people. You know, my friends, in Matthew 24, it tells us that we will be hated of all nations. Pastor was talking about that chapter uh, last week in a couple weeks before, that we will be hated, another translation says, of all people. What will God do when the serpent once again spew out of his mouth, when the dragon spews out of his mouth people, nations, the flood, to carry us away 
to destruction, then God used the wilderness, then God used the earth to help the woman. What will he use in these last days? But the same thing to preserve us, to protect us, to nourish us. Well, the Bible is clear as to what the earth represents as well. If water represents multitudes and nations and people, we know the earth is the opposite of that. And the earth represents a place that is sparsely populated. Now we're talking about the time period once again of 538 to 1798, as the Bible tells us here, 1260 days. When we work it out one day for a year in Bible prophecy, it boils down to that period of time. And God used what we have studied and come to the understanding from prophecy as the very nation here of America before it was built up as it is right now to help the woman to swallow up the flood. The people of God had to flee from the face of the serpent uh, in Europe and come to this America. You see, friends, uh, the devil, working through pagan Rome, tried to destroy Jesus, tried to destroy the people of God, but he didn't stop there. He further went on to start working through papal Rome to destroy the church of God. And God opened up the America to receive his people. That was the standard that he raised up against the enemy when he came in like a flood. But he does not give up, my friends. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy me. He wants to destroy anyone who name the name of the Lord. And so verse 17 tells us, the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now the dragon is not just going after the woman then, now he's going after the remnant of the woman, which, my friends, verse 17 is where we are. This is where we are in history. The remnant of the woman are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we know is the spirit of prophecy, which we find all throughout the scriptures. He wants to destroy anyone who names the name of Lord, anyone who takes his righteousness by faith. But let's answer the question that I asked before. Where do we see in the Bible that God took his people and brought them to the wilderness? Well, friends, it is the very same experience to which we started out talking about in the beginning and that is when God took his people from Egypt and he was bringing them to the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 has something very interesting here to say about this, very applicable to our time and to our circumstances. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 and you can turn in your Bibles with me there, my friends, and notice here it gives us more reason as to why God brings his people into the wilderness, why he did not just save them in Egypt, why he did not just leave them right next door to Egypt, but rather he brought them away from Egypt to save them. You see, my friends, the standard that God wants to raise up for his people in these last days and will raise up for his people in these last days is the same standard that he raised up for his people in the Exodus experience. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, it says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do them, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Has God promised us a land, my friends? Is there 
a promised land to which the people of God who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light uh, are journeying to. Are we journeying to the heavenly Canaan? God has promised us to bring us into that new heaven and that new earth. Verse 2, and he says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years. Where did God lead them? In the wilderness. Why did God lead them in the wilderness? To humble you, he says. Why does God want us, my friends, to move away from these great cities, to go into the wilderness as it were, one here we are told, it is to humble us. Number two, it is to prove us, he says, that we may know what is in our hearts, whether we will keep the commandments of God or not, whether we will live obedient lives to him. Again, friends, God can save us in the city. He has the power to do that. But friends, that will not work because of our human condition, our human frailty. We will not serve him all right there. Now someone may be saying, well, what about Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael? What about those Hebrews boys? Oh, friends, let us not abuse ourselves with that story. Those did not choose to go to Babylon, but were brought to Babylon as slaves, and God used them as a witness there. And you would notice that God delivered or brought his people out of Babylon. That's not his perfect will. That was his permissive will. Uh, and God used that experience as a judgment, but also he used it as a witness to the Babylonians then. But God is calling us in these last days, my friends, to go to the wilderness, the place where he wants to humble us and to prove us and to help us that we may know what in our hearts so that we may keep his commandments. Verse 3 says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee, or allowed thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Many are wondering, how in the world are we going to be provided for? How am I going to take care of my family? What am I going to do? But here the Bible tells us, my friends, when God brought them to the wilderness, he humbled them and he fed them. God is the one that's responsible for keeping us in the wilderness. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. In other words, they did not know where their sustenance was going to come from. They did not know how they were going to be fed, but God miraculously provided for his people in that wilderness experience. No, is he the God only of that time and not of the time in which we're living? Is he only the God of the Jews, the God of the Hebrews, and not the God of the people who are serving him today? We who have put our faith in him, or hope in him, or trust in him? Is he not the same God as yesterday? That is the God of today, friends, is still the same God. The God that provided for them then is the God that will provide for us today and tomorrow and for always. No, it goes on to say here, after God provided manner which they did not know, it goes on to say, not even their fathers knew that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And God, my friends, has given us his word that he will take care of us. Once we meet the condition, friends, then the promise of God will be verified upon us. Many of us claim the promise of Psalm 91. But, oh, friends, we have to meet the condition. And God will take care of us 
just like he took care of his people then in the wilderness in that Exodus experience. Just like he took care of his people during the dark ages of the years 538 through 1798 when he brought his people to the wilderness. Just like he took care of them when he brought them from Europe from the face of the papacy to the United States of America. And now, friends, once again, God has to bring us into that wilderness experience so that he could provide for us, protect us, preserve us, just like he has always done for his people. Friends, God has a track record of being faithful. God has a track record track record of keeping his word. So why won't we trust him? Just like we have trusted him in other circumstances, why don't we trust him now? You know, the, the, the song says, um, trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then it says, what a burden we bear. How much sorrow we share. Needlessly, friends, because we do not trust and obey him. Remember, friends, we have to take him at his word. If he's going to raise up that standard against the enemy when the enemy comes in like a flood. Now go back with me to Revelation chapter 12, friends. Let's close up right here. Revelation chapter 12, just like Isaiah 59 verse 19 and 20, there we see clearly that the enemy comes in like a flood. Verse 13 tells us that he persecutes the woman. Verse 14, God says, uh, there it tells us that God brings her into the wilderness for a time period. Verse 15 tells us there, the serpent cast out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might carry her away, that he might destroy her. And all friends, you know that the flood comes in various forms, not just in the form of people seeking to take the lives of God's people, but it comes in the form of the media as well. You see, it comes in the form of philosophies and ideas that can do as much destruction to our spiritual condition as the armies of Rome could have done to the bodies of the saints. But verse 16 tells us that the earth helped the woman. Once again, God intervened and he helped her. So we can see, friends, that the dragon, the serpent, the devil, the enemy has always been after God's church. From the Old Testament time, from the time periods of Jesus and the disciples, and even after their time, during the Dark Ages, the enemy has always been coming after God's church, always seeking to rush in like a flood. But he did not stop with the woman. Friends, verse 17 tells us that he was wroth with the woman, but now he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you and I fit into this group, my friends, you better believe that the enemy is going to come after us. We are going to be faced with trials, temptations, and tribulation. We who are the remnant of her seed, please notice, my friends, the remnant of the woman's seed are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He doesn't go after those who do not. And friends, please, let's remember, we keep the commandments of God by the power of God and by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is not about works religion, but this is about obedience unto righteousness. Living up to what God has said, following the dictates that God puts forth in the law of liberty. And there is only one group of people today that I can see that profess to hold on to the commandments of God and even the testimony of Jesus, and that is the group that we are a part of today. And so, friends, the enemy is going to come in and rush in like a flood upon us. But notice there isn't a verse 18. 
to tell us exactly what God is going to do when he comes in like a flood, the understanding is already presented to us in the previous verses of Scripture. What he has always done is what he is going to do for us in these last days, my friends. So, friends, let us trust him. Let us hold on to him. And, friends, I want you to take this verse of Scripture as we close up today. And that is Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. In fact, the previous verses, my friends, tells us of the time when we, the remnant of God, the remnant of the woman, will go forth to present the last message, the loud cry. It's spoken of there in Daniel chapter 11, verse 44 and 45. But, oh, friends, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, comes into the picture. God comes in and he raises his standard. In fact, the very same Michael that was fighting against the dragon in Revelation chapter 12, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, tells us, and at that very time, friends, the time when the enemy thinks he has us in his clutches, when he's about to stamp us out is at the time, my friends, when it says at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. Michael is about to raise up a standard, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. What will Michael do? And at that time, Thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Oh, friends, the question is to be asked of us today. Is our names written in the book? The Lamb's book of life, my friends, is your name there? Is my name there? Because it's at that time when the enemy will rush in like a flood that Michael will stand up and he will deliver his people, everyone whose names are written in that book. Those who trust him all day long, like Isaiah 59 verse 19 tells us. Those who turn from their transgression in Israel, Isaiah 59 and verse 20 tells us those who are the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who are carrying forth the heritage that the woman, the pure church of God, handed down to the remnant in these last days. Oh, friends, there's so much in these chapters. And as you could see, we uh, danced around a bit there because we don't have the time to look at everything that's there, friends. But I just want to remind us that God has not left us alone. Oh, friends, Jesus promised, he said, that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. But before he goes, he promised, he says, I will be with you even to the ends of the earth. In your circumstance, in my circumstance, God is there right now, this very moment. And in all our circumstances, he will be there. But friends, there is a particular time coming when we will need not to be in these great cities. We would need to be in the wilderness, as it were, because, friends, that is how God is going to raise up a standard against the enemy. That is how God is going to protect his people. That is how he is going to deliver us from the face of the serpent, from the dragon, from the devil, as it were. It is when, my friends, we take him at his word, when we hold on to his promises, when we meet that condition, friends, that God's promise will be verified upon us. Oh, friends, the time is coming. Let us be ready. Let us take God at his word and let us go forward trusting, hoping, and believing that he will do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we are grateful to you for what you have done in the lives of your people. 
these are great examples for us to look up to and to live up to. Lord, your word is filled with your divine intervention in the lives of your people. And what you have done then, Lord, is what you would do for us today. Oh, friends, we read in the scriptures that there is no new thing under the sun, said Solomon. So principally speaking, Father, what we have seen in the past, as Solomon says, that which has been is the very same things which will be. The devil is no match for you, Lord. We know that. You who are supreme, you who are all-powerful, and he knows that too. Oh, Lord, we see uh, in Revelation chapter 12 that he knows he has a short time to live, and that is why he's going about such uh, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But, oh, friends, help us to know that the time is short, oh, God. Help us to know that the time is short also, just like the devil knows, and that it is time for us to move with urgency so that, Lord, you can raise up your standard for your people and that the Redeemer can come to Zion. Father, we thank you for all the encouragements in your word, all the messages that have been presented, Lord, the studies that have been done, the testimonies, Lord, the songs that have been sung. Oh, Father, may they truly buoy our spirits up and encourage our hearts that we may continue to go forward holding on to your unchanging hands, trusting you, that, Lord, you will do for us what you will say you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.